Travelling through the countryside from town to town is faster now than ever before, but since the beaching railway closures in the 1960s, journeys of this kind are increasingly done by car. Cities carry the main burden of this change. The extra road traffic adds greatly to their problems, especially since transport affects most other aspects of city life, such as housing, employment, education and health. Cities developed in a chaotic way. In the 19th century, the population explosion, development of factories and the advent of the railways led to rapid unplanned growth. The factories pour their filth into the atmosphere. The workers live next door because without any means of transport, they had to walk to work. The slums were foul, sanitation was primitive, and outbreaks of diseases such as typhoid and cholera were common. The rich could escape to the edges of towns, away from the slums. They lived in their genteel suburbs and could afford to hire a driver in his hackney carriage when they went to town. There were also the carriage folk who owned their own vehicles and horses. These were kept in the mews, which were built behind each row of houses. For long distance journeys, steam trains provided a form of transport, which though expensive, was at least a public service. But railways were of limited use in the city, and the rapidly growing suburbs were without any form of regular public transport, until the introduction of the horse bus, which became common on the streets of most towns in the 1850s. Although the horse bus was cheaper than taking a hackney cab, fares were expensive, and buses were the preserve of the well-to-do, even in the 1900s. They were also slow-moving, only a little faster than walking pace. The mixture of slow horse buses, hansom cabs and delivery vehicles caused chaos on the roads. An important breakthrough was the horse tram, which ran on its own rails, laid in the street. The tram was more efficient than a bus, because a horse could pull twice the load on rails that it could on roads. Although horse trams had been introduced in the United States in the 1830s, they were late coming to Britain. The legislation needed to allow rails to be laid was blocked by Parliament until 1870, when the Tramways Act was passed. This was a slight advance, but it didn't provide a sound basis for progress. By the Act, local authorities were denied the right to operate tramcar services. The authorities could insist on laying the track, but were then obliged to lease their lines to private companies. The maximum period of lease was 21 years, after which local authorities could apply a compulsory purchase order and take over the tramways. This removed all incentive for the private companies to electrify or make other improvements. The UK investors were turning their backs on British tramways. The uncertainty that hung over the tramway operations after the expiry of the 21 years was quickly dispelled by one municipality, the city of Glasgow, which pioneered a very radical departure. In 1894, the lease of the tramway company was coming to an end, and the corporation said they would like to take it over. The problem there was that the company didn't want to sell its assets, and it had no alternative because under the 1870 Tramways Act, Glasgow were empowered to buy them. But they couldn't buy, or the corporation weren't able to persuade the company to sell them, that is the horses and the vehicles, and of course the men. So they had to start off themselves and create effectively a parallel transport system. So that at midnight on the 30th of June 1894, when the company stopped running its horse trams, the following day, they could put their own vehicles on. The first act of the new corporation, when it took over running Glasgow's trams, was to introduce a new cheap fare of a halfpenny. This proved very popular, and within two years, they were carrying 60% more passengers than before the corporation takeover. The city's experiment had proved a success. Glasgow was very pleased with the success of its tramway and wanted to expand it because it wanted, in fact, to use the benefits of increased locomotion to spread out the population, get rid of slums, or that sort of thing. But horse tramways reached the limit of their technology. 
As towns continued to spread, the search for faster transport became urgent. The obvious alternative was to use a steam locomotive to haul the tram. The locomotive contained the driver and passengers rode in the tram car behind. But steam trams were cumbersome and expensive to run. Electricity was a better answer and it was the solution adopted in Glasgow. The corporation electrified its first tram service in 1898 with great success and quickly began converting the rest of its horse routes. The trams were, by present day standards, extraordinarily frequent. If you were walking out of town, you would be passed by a tram every 25 seconds. 63% of the passengers in Glasgow only paid a halfpenny fare. You would go 25 miles for tuppence. The Street Railway Journal, which was the leading transport journal in the world, said in 1919, that Glasgow had the cheapest and most frequent tramway system in the whole world. Glasgow's tramways were an all-round success. They provided an excellent service and they ran at a profit. Many other corporations tried to follow suit. Most cities and many smaller towns soon acquired electric tramways. The opening of a tramway was an important event, attended by all the local dignitaries. In 1913, more than twice as many people travelled by tram as travelled by train. Trams were not only used for carrying passengers, they were sometimes used for carrying goods and parcels, and even for delivering mail. Trams were held in great affection by the people they served, and were a symbol of civic pride, West Ham marked the 21st anniversary of its tramways in 1925 with a specially decorated car. Such garlanded trams were quite a common sight at local events. Municipal operators were prepared to go to a lot of trouble to celebrate their service. By the 1920s, trams were to be found in almost every major town and the tram lines seemed to stretch everywhere, even out into semi-rural areas like Hampton Court on the banks of the Thames. The tram performed an important social function in these years. Trams were usually run by the local council, and the fares were cheaper than those of the private buses. So at last, working people had a way of moving around town, and even of taking an outing. A bank holiday was one of the few occasions when ordinary people could escape from their surroundings. In Birmingham, for instance, fleets of trams were laid on for the mass of people wanting to get out of town for the day. The tram ride was quite fun in itself, and it dropped them right out in the countryside. At its height in the 1920s, the network of tram routes was so extensive but in theory at least, a passenger could travel halfway across the country by tramcar, although in practice longer journeys were done by train. The development of municipal tramways, especially in the north of England, was influenced by social policy aims which were only partly to do with transport. At the beginning of this century, several industrial cities undertook surveys of their slum areas with a view to improving housing. The 1901 survey undertaken in Leeds was one example. 
the spate of concern was a byproduct of the Boer War, when medical examinations had shown up the poor state of health of most of the men who enlisted. Little headway was made in solving the problem until the First World War, when similar revelations shocked the complacent once again. The government made grants available for slum clearance. The Leeds Corporation bought land for development at Middleton, an old mining village five miles to the south of the city. An estate was built there to high standards, to house 10,000 people. It took 10 years to build, and the grandparents of some of today's residents were moved out to Middleton 60 years ago. It was built in the 1920s by the Leeds City Council as a purpose-built council development on a large scale. It was one of the very first developments of this size in the country. And the whole idea of it was to take people away from the industrial part of South Leeds, where people had lived in slums for many years, to an attractive countryside part of Leeds. The estate was laid out like a town within a city. It had its own facilities, shops, churches, a cinema, everything anybody could want to need. And it was quite a thing in the 20s. They had inside toilets, they had bathrooms, they had gardens. And instead of looking out of their windows, seeing industrial grime and smoky factories, which they did in, in, in Hunslet and Holbeck parts of Leeds, they could see open countryside. And there's something to look forward to when they come home from work. The council saw transport as an integral part of this new development. It constructed a new tramway from the centre of Leeds out to Middleton while the estate was being built. A second estate at Belle Isle also had its own tramway to take people into the centre of Leeds, and the two tramways were finally linked in the late 1940s. The Middleton tramway was built on reserved track, separated from road traffic, much like a railway. On reserved track, the trams could reach much higher speeds than would have been allowed on public roads. This led the corporation to introduce Britain's most sophisticated, most advanced tram cars, the Middleton bogies. They gave a smoother ride than most trams, and with a seating capacity of 70, were larger than average. They were more popular than the other trams which ran on the route. The service was frequent and fares were low. Even in fog and snow, the trams were reliable and safe. The route also passed through some very varied scenery. It ran up from Parkside, through Middleton Woods behind us, through, through the trees and actually just where we're sat now on its own right of way and then it ran along the perimeter of the estate to make a terminus down by Lingwell Road North. It was always an adventure as a small boy because of its uniqueness as a tramway you saw all sorts of things through the windows. You'd pass Unslit Rugby League ground in South Leeds, now not no more and then as you entered up towards the woods you'd pass allotments pig styes, hen runs, all nature would be there. Then he entered the woods themselves. And at certain times of the year, the woods would just literally be one blanket of lovely blue bluebells. And I don't think no house in Belisle or Middleton were class respectable if it didn't have a jam jar with a bunch of bluebells in it at that time of year. Many thousands of bunches must have been taken home by tram. It's quite an impressive thing to be going into the woods when darkness was falling and stand there relatively quiet place apart from the wildlife you'd hear the tracks humming you'd hear the overhead hissing and then you see this great big steel beast come into view Middleton lost its trams in 1957 and now there's a bus which follows part of the old tram route and serves the same estates It was a very working class estate, a very tough estate, and a relatively poor estate. Most people were working class. They worked either at Middleton Colliery, or like my father, a railway man, or in industry in South Leeds. But a very proud estate. We used the tram from Belisle Top, which was the last extension to the tramway in 1948 and 9, to get to school on the Middleton estate. And on certain types of tram on the Middleton route, the driver would sit in his own cab. And so it was quite easy to nip down the back staircase when you saw the conductor coming up to get the fares. 
because in them days, public transport were always full. And the short journey of around a mile and a half, non-stop often, meant it quite a lot of fares to get in a very short period of time. And it was very easy to nip along the upper deck when you saw him coming up the back staircase and nip down the front, knowing the driver was in his own cab. And by the time he'd, by the time he'd sorted himself out, the conductor, he'd jumped off and they were away to school and he'd a bit of extra money in your pocket to spend at the local tuck shop. You had to have a frequent service on a tramway to justify its expense. The service started earlier in the morning than the buses do today and continued till later in the evening. And of course, it was a very cheap service. It had to be a cheap service because it was serving a working class district. The Middleton route, because it had these fast trams, because it had an increased speed limit, wasn't linked to any other services until the very end of tramway operation. It was always an isolated tramway showpiece, and it gave the Middleton residents one of the finest tramway services this country has ever seen, or possibly will ever see in the future. Most towns grew rapidly in the years before and after the First World War. But the growth was largely unplanned and had a haphazard connection with transport, which was soon complicated by the growing use of the motor car. Almost overnight, countryside had been converted into towns. Rustic lanes had been replaced by tram and bus routes, and the property speculators followed. Trees were all that remained as a reminder of the open fields that the builders had filled with houses. The speculative builders of the 30s were incorporating garages and uh, lots of road space into their schemes, especially where they were building more expensive houses. So you begin to find private estates of the 30s spreading out in quite a suburban sprawl kind of way um, over quite large areas at a fairly low density. And that's generally gone on where planning authorities have permitted it ever since, with cars and the provision for cars being a central feature of the way estates are laid out. The uh, great problem with that, of course, is that if you build urban areas in that way, then it's almost impossible ever to provide a good public transport service because people are very dispersed and spread out. The opposite of what you need if you're going to have good public transport, which is basically to group and in, to some de degree bunch the settlement areas around the routes for the public transport. Private developers building in those kind of towns were essentially looking for accessible locations where they could take advantage of the fact that the public sector had already provided the roads, transport, sewage, which is very important, water supplies. And it was a period in which we had a lot of what got called ribbon development, housing just on little strips of land along the roadside. And that was a very profitable kind of development for builders to undertake. These lines of semi-detached houses were difficult to serve by public transport. And when the motor car began to pour out of the factories in the 1920s, it found a ready market in the ever-growing suburbs. Motorists were rich and articulate, and though they were only a tiny minority, they very quickly formed a powerful lobby. The motorists objected to being held up by trams, and the tram became widely and unjustly vilified as a cause of traffic congestion. Motor vehicles frequently overtook trams on the inside, forcing their way through passengers who were crossing the road to board a tram. Although motors were supposed to give way, there were many accidents. The motoring lobby blamed it all on the trams. The tram's image began to suffer. The tram cars were often old and they were compared unfavorably with the latest buses. The motor bus was not the only option. Experiments with the trolley bus began before the First World War. The trolley bus was more flexible than a tram. It could pull into the curb to pick up passengers, but it was still powered by an overhead electricity supply and was therefore clean and quiet. The replacement of petrol by more reliable diesel engines gave the motor bus an added advantage. There was an obvious conflict between different road users trying to assert their rights to the public highway and a Royal Commission was set up in 1928 to look at the future of transport. 
The information collected by the Commission didn't support the main claims against the tram. Traffic congestion, for instance, could not be blamed on the tram. The evidence showed that trams were an efficient, cost-effective and safe form of transport. Yet the Commission recommended that no more tramways should be built and that existing ones should be gradually abandoned. Municipalities were influenced to various degrees by the report. Leeds developed new bus services in the 1930s and commissioned some streamlined models. But it continued to invest in its tramways at the same time, upgrading some routes by building new sections of reserved track. There were even plans for taking the trams underground through the city centre in tunnels like the one at Kingsway, London. Ideas of this kind were shelved during the Second World War. After the war, the trams were in a very run-down state and needed replacing or modernising. It was all going to cost so much more than the pre-war estimates and money was very tight. After fierce arguments, the council decided to scrap the trams. The changeover took years to implement and trams carried on running right through the 50s. Glasgow, by contrast, was determined to keep its trams and built a hundred new ones in 1950. It also considered installing a new tram system, which would have included an underground section. But Glasgow was becoming increasingly the odd one out in Britain. One by one, the major cities decided to abandon their trams. Outsiders came to see Glasgow as a relic from the past, but it was a past that many of them would have liked to bring back. In most towns where trams were abandoned, the public was not convinced that the right decision had been taken. They were assured that the removal of their trams would not lead to any inconvenience. They were told that motor or trolley buses would be cheaper to run and that they would be faster. But often when the changeover happened, the benefits failed to appear. Birmingham's trams were replaced by buses in 1953, and within a few months, the fares were increased by 18%. This experience didn't deter other cities already on the path to abandoning their trams. Four years later, Liverpool said goodbye to its trams. On the buses which replaced them, the fares went up and services were cut back within months. Even Glasgow cracked and got rid of its trams. The last one ran in 1962. With the trams also went the women drivers. Only men were employed to drive buses because of a union agreement. In its heyday, the tram provided the most reliable and frequent public transport service that this country has ever had. Britain's decision to scrap its trams was the first in a long line of decisions designed to reduce the capital cost of public transport by reducing the quality. Neither the local authorities nor government saw the provision of good public transport as a necessary expense. Even from an accounting point of view, scrapping trams was a very short-sighted move. For although the initial cost of installing tramways is high, the running costs can be lower than those of any other form of effective public transport. And this has been proved where tramways have been retained. Many cities and towns on the continent have kept their trams and modernised them and are now reaping the benefits.
the Channel 4 book, Losing Track, by Kerry Hamilton and Stephen Potter, is available from booksellers at £7.95 in paperback. <laughs>